dress for women is the first of arts, the one that contains all the others. It is her offensive armor, her harmonious palette. These sentiments by the French writer Uzan couldn't have been expressed before the 19th century because it's only then that women became the conspicuously fashionable sex. Paris is the fashion capital of the world and it's where I show my collections. In the last 50 years of the 19th century, Paris fashion attained an opulence undreamed of before, stimulated by the birth of haute couture. Fashion, by its very nature, is ephemeral, and for the artists of the time, it seemed to be a barometer of the changes that were sweeping through society. En fait, après la Révolution, euh, l'homme abandonne tout euh, luxe et frivolité qui, en fait, était, After the French Revolution. Men gave up the outward appearance of luxury and frivolity because they were associated with the aristocracy, who were seen as the tyrants of the past. So women took on the entire fashion role. They became reflections of their husbands, worldly reflections, expressing the couple's wealth. And so, from that moment on, perhaps even more than before, a lady was constantly on display. She had to follow an extremely complicated timetable, wearing particular outfits for different times of day and for different occasions, all of which required specific types of clothes. She had to change at least seven or eight times each day. A lady began her day by putting on a fairly luxurious garment called a peignoir or dressing gown. It could only be worn in the privacy of her own home. Then, if she had to go out to do some shopping in town, she wore another outfit, which was fairly sober. The afternoon was usually taken up with visits to friends. And depending on the person she was visiting, she wore different types of clothes. But of course, this always included a hat, a shawl and gloves. Although daytime clothing was very concealing, in the evening, dresses gradually became more and more revealing. A dinner dress was quite different from the sort of dress one would wear to the theater. An evening dress, or one for a grand soirée, was something else entirely. So it became very complicated. In fact, during the 19th century, very strict rules of society were laid down which were interpreted and expressed by fashion. Every extra activity required special dress. To visit the seaside, the races, to walk, ride or bicycle in the Bois de Boulogne, there was a dress code for every event. You were on permanent display, part of a great fashion parade. A grand event like this fancy dress ball kept Paris gossiping for weeks and was reported in nearly a hundred fashion magazines. Manet painted his pupil, Eva Gonzalez, as a free and strong-willed artist. He did not collaborate in the male view of woman as an ostentatious image of luxury, the female side of his own soul. However, in her self-portrait, Gonzalez chooses to be this stereotype, revealing herself to be romantic and feminine. Her gorgeous dress with the red bow of her bustle catches the eye and then leads our gaze towards the discreet reflection of her face in the mirror. Disembodied, she becomes that immaterial being 
venerated by writers and painters, an archetype simultaneously dreamed of and inaccessible. In the 19th century, men became more fetishistic about women's clothes. All this luxury and frivolity which was denied to them made men into voyeurs. In the novel Madame Bovary, the husband, Charles, could not stop himself from touching over and over again her comb, her skirts, her shawl. Corbet punctured the hypocrisy of his age with this painting and caused a scandal. No decent woman would have allowed herself to be seen half-dressed lying on a riverbank. It broke the artistic convention that a woman could be painted even nude in outdoor scenery so long as she had a bit of draped cloth around her, proving that she was a goddess. The gloves she's wearing forced the point that she was not a goddess, but a real woman wearing her own clothes. When speaking of his painting Nana, Manet said, the satin corset is perhaps the nude of our time. Realist painters like Courbet and Manet were committed to copying life as it really was, and they were surrounded by fashion. La mode devient euh, extrêmement importante pour les peintres. Artists also saw the ephemeral qualities of fashion as an expression of modern life. The masses of fashion plates which proliferated at this time depicted women in situations and settings that had never been shown before. They recorded the mood of the moment and became a source of inspiration for 19th century painters. Whether it was women seeing in public gardens, out walking, women in the street or in front of shops wearing their fashionable clothes, fashion plates and engravings provided artists with new exciting possibilities and they began to express more freedom in their painting. When one looks at Manet's paintings of La Gare Saint-Lazare, or music in the Tuileries Gardens, one can't help but draw a parallel between 19th century fashion and painting. Today, we take for granted the idea of coming into a shop like this, choosing a dress, paying for it and wearing it to go to dinner that night. But ready-to-wear dresses for women didn't exist before 1870. Before then, a lady bought fabric and took it to a dressmaker. Frederick Worth, an Englishman, opened the first haute couture fashion house in Paris in 1858. He showed his creations to his customers on live models and boasted that he was inspired by paintings. He had all the cheek in the world when he said, I have Delacroix's sense of color and I compose. A toilette is as good as a painting. His success with the imperial court caused an explosion of people trying to copy his designs. Magazines full of fashion engravings and the development of mass manufacture meant that every woman could have something in her wardrobe that had filtered down from his imagination and the great couturiers that followed him. So. This is a dress from the last collection for, for, for winter and the, the first idea was both a painting and fabric. And I think that uh, on a good, especially a couture collection, we have uh, two kinds of uh, dresses. One born through a sketch, through an idea, through a connection with history or whatever, and uh, a second kind of dress which appear in the last weeks of the collection and uh, which are just material, and material living their own life 
and dictating the, the dress itself. And this is a dress which is the both style, because I, I wanted this effect, which is uh, around uh, 1880s, but a little bit uh, 1905. And uh, the first idea was a Boldini painting. And uh, when I received this material, which is not a, a specific color, it's not lime, it's not cream, it's a fascinating color. Yeah, the, now, uh, today, the light is strange, but when we discovered it, it was such a, a scene of gourmandise, of it was, we had um, water in our mouth looking at it. Yeah. And we just put it around the, the corset, and it, we had this because these materials needed some softness and stiffness in the same time. And of course we had uh, a shawl because we, couture is operatic. It's made for special event, for special customer, for just one evening. But um, I don't the idea of timeless in fashion. I think that fashion must, must be something, it's always different and uh, even if you look at the Boldini painting you give it the impulse of uh, nowadays a poetic one or a very violent one but the feeling you have in the moment you, you, you design. For me I think the focus of a lady is the waist exactly. and um, especially if the skirt is long because you're coming right up to the waist and then you have this like on the bust with this wonderful décolleté and what it is doing it is all talking about the face and the intelligence and like the personality exactly, of the woman exactly yeah, yeah. and i hate when some especially a french uh, uh, way of uh, thinking that uh, uh, the true elegance is uh, forgetting the dress and have just one woman i don't think so i think it's just uh, a very intimate and sensual chemistry we need to capture in between the woman and the dress. Prudence, just tell me about the different... The essence of haute couture is that everything is individually made by hand. Prudence is a couture hat maker. I don't like to look at an outfit and think, what a hat. I think it's an exclamation point and it can make an outfit go in one direction or another and it's so subtle that people don't seem to notice and I think just by the fact that you have something on your head anyway um, is important enough. I don't think it has to be huge or in three different loud colors or a huge huge crown and a small brim. I just think that if you pay attention to using classical techniques and having a really good foundation and paying attention to line and proportion then everything hopefully should fall into place but I think it's really important that when someone comes out even if it is at a show for people in the audience to just say that woman is so well dressed if I could only look like that and they really don't know what it is and I would hate it if someone came out and said oh those hats were so wonderful or, you know, it's the same thing, I suppose, those shoes were so wonderful. I mean, you should think that she just looks beautifully dressed, and people really miss that point. The girls are really important for Asdin when he makes fitting, because he needs a perfect body. And he puts the material first on the girl, and he looks the way the material goes down, and after he makes a special toile, I don't know the name in English, Twelve. So, and after he cut the material again in leather, and uh, he, he do it, he do it, uh, he change, you know, because the material never stay like a toile. So he had to do again with the true material. And uh, he likes the perfection, and he is like a sculptor. Yeah, that's very important. So now he, he make all the things on the body. Azadine Alaya applies couture methods to the prototypes for his ready-to-wear collections. That's why his clothes fit so well, and his reputation is based on that. 
Unless haute couture is kept going, then ready-to-wear will starve from lack of ideas. Commercial efficiency will destroy fashion. It's uh, completely made by hand, and that's very important for him all the time to show the line, like this. That's typical. He makes the body more more thin, more perfect, with a special perfect line. The, the women are really, really fantastic, really sexy, really beautiful, <laughs> because all the men are looking in the back, actually, when you see that. You have your eyes who go like this, and for the body it's perfect, this line, no? He used this line too for the knitwear and make a special Parisian woman. Toute femme essaie de euh, d'être une Parisienne, et c'est vraiment. Euh... Every woman tries to be a Parisienne, the fashionable woman of Paris. This is a label which was already in use in the 19th century and which has continued right up to today. Painters really tried to capture the essence of the true Parisienne, and there were very particular features which matched the ideal. The little turned up nose, the small face and mouth, the little foot just showing under her dress. And it's quite amusing to note that this need to portray women of fashion through the role model of the Parisienne started at that time and has continued to the present day. Il naît à cette époque et puis euh, resté un thème euh, de maintenant toujours. Paris in the 19th century was the center of the world where everything was happening. American heiresses looked for titles. Russian emigres dazzled actresses with gifts of diamonds. Artists and writers flocked to this style factory. Everybody, including foreign royalty, came to Paris. Elizabeth, the Empress of Austria, was a beauty with a tall figure, an 18-inch waist, and a mass of hair that reached to her knees. The best-known portrait of her is this one by Winterhalter. Wearing one of West's famous jewel dresses, she established in this portrait the idea of the fairy princess. Here in the Musée de la Mode in Paris, three of her dresses which survive are being exhibited. This is the dress that she wore on the eve of her marriage at the age of 16. The scattering of tiny embroidered flowers and the rivulets of green ribbon frills seem just the right decorative touches to enhance the airy dreaminess of this volume of muslin. But from her youth, she really preferred the color black. It's very important for me to come here to look at the actual clothes that people wore. The effect of the different surfaces and the textures of black on black, the almost organic growth of the braid trimming and lace frills and the jet beads dripping over it like black water. One gains so much inspiration from the perfection of it all. I accept Worth's claim that he was an artist, for this is truly a triumph of composition. A beautiful form is a beautiful idea. The mannequins had to be specially built to fit the proportions of Elizabeth's imposing figure, which seems to herald the supermodels of the 1980s. But in her later years, she hid her face with hats, parasols, fans, and sometimes a mask. To make clothes for today, if we want something new, we have to go back into the past. In Berlin, the castle of Charlottenburg houses a very special painting by Watto. It was commissioned as a shop sign by a picture dealer called Gersant. I am drawn into this painting like a witness of a real moment in time. As the portrait of Louis XIV is put to rest in a packing case, 
It signifies the dawn of a new age and of the style we call Rococo, which owes so much to the charm of Vato's art. The lady who's just stepped up from the street into the shop shows as the back of her dress, which is often referred to as the Vato gown because it's in so many of his paintings. This dress seems to sum up the age and it lasted for 70 years until the French Revolution. Here in the Wallace Collection in London, the same style dress can be seen from the front in the portrait by Boucher of Madame Pompadour, who was Louis XV's mistress. Luckily for me, these silks are still being produced, so I copied this dress. And day dresses and suits with swinging backs crept into my collection. When I then went on to develop this idea, I chose green silk taffeta. I remembered the way the dress in Vato's painting of the sign of Gersant followed the movement of the lady as she stepped to one side. I wanted to get the life of this movement into the dress, so I worked with my pattern cutter to bring out this asymmetry. Fired with a burning interest to incorporate this vital asymmetry into the clothes for a whole collection, I worked on little suits which began to look as if they were being blown by the wind. We gave them names like Little Breeze Suit and Storm Jacket and then came the Squall Coat and one of the evening dresses was called the Hurricane. So whilst drinking tea one day in my London studio, the title came to me, Storm in a Teacup. The Lady Muse I carry in my head liked the title and I knew that she could maintain her equilibrium through every storm and all the drama of a crazy world because she has taste. I practiced with my hair and makeup artists and a face emerged, glamorous in its look of distraction, reflecting the world she sees, facing up to the horror of uniformity and minimalism. If there are any children listening who would like to be fashion designers, my advice to you is learn to draw by copying. All great artists spent much of their lives copying the drawings of artists who had lived before them. Look at paintings, look at clothes in museums. One day you may be allowed into the museum archives to see how clothes are sewn. You'll be amazed when you look at the structure inside them. Nobody can do this for you. Just like reading, people can't read the books for you. You have to do it. This is what's called self-discipline, and it's the only path to true pleasure. It's only with a lot of trouble and effort that you can make your work look spontaneous and easy and a delight to us all. Most of fashion has to do with being frivolous. People should be frivolous. It's very good for them.